for your word. The Lord just be with him now as he delivers and teaches us about the essential revelation that we need to know for what's coming up. In Jesus' name, Amen. 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 Well, I hope you're in expectation of hearing from God today. Um, the revelation is something that uh, people tend to steer away from. Um, and yet we're told that blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and heed the things which are written in it for the time is near. And what is it that's near, brethren? What is it that's been near from the moment of Christ's ascension? It is the second advent. It is the glorious return of Christ in the retribution, in judgment, to establish his kingdom, the messianic age. And uh, it is that book of the apocalypse, the book of the conclusion of earth history. And... Um, it's filled with that end of the world language, but it is also, as I've said, prophetic. So I just want to um, remind us of the three periods that I believe uh, this uh, book is dealing with. Sorry? Oh, okay. As long as all this, everything's there, that's fine. So we have three future periods that are de described in the book of Revelation. That is a, a period known as the Great Tribulation, uh, which Jesus Christ himself spoke about, which we believe is a seven-year period of divine judgment poured out upon the earth. And that, following that will come uh, the return of our Lord Jesus, with ourselves, by the way, to reign and rule with Christ on the earth. So whatever houses you've got, whatever cars you've got, whatever money's in your bank, it, it means nothing in the, in the big picture. It, it is all temporal. This is where we're heading. This is where we'll be. And depending on what we do here in the, in, in the here and now, will depend on where we will be placed in that kingdom, what roles, what responsibilities we will have. And of course, the preparation of... Uh, Ourselves, I think, through that millennial kingdom will prepare us for the eternal realm, the new heavens and new earth. So we believe in this interim period that's described in Revelation. So that's our position, a futurist position. And so we approach Revelation literally. We read it literally, unless otherwise um, indicated historically and grammatically. So what about this chapter we're looking at today? Um, in fact... Um, there's a, a quick schema of the. If you bring it up, there we go. So that's where that's our position. You can see the church age. You can see uh, what we call the rapture of the church, which we believe takes place around about Revelation chapter four, as uh, John is raptured, harpazo caught up, and that begins this tribulation period. In other words, everything thereafter is to do with that future period. And then we have the return of Christ and uh, the eternal state. So there's lots we could talk about, but that just gives you an overview. If you go on to the next slide, please, the story so far. <clears throat> uh, I won't go through all of those, but that's what we've been through so far. And if you do want to catch up, you can do that through the website. There's a, um, a link there to all of our Revelation series. And that's where we've got to chapter 15. Um, so it's a bit small there but chapter 15 let's uh, read it together uh, chapter 15 of Revelation and then we'll begin to go through so if you have your Bibles it reads in uh, the New American Standard now I saw another sign in heaven great and marvellous seven angels who had seven plagues which are the last because in them the wrath of God is finished. 
And I saw something like a sea of glass mixed with fire. And those who had been victorious over the beast and his image and the number of his name were standing on the sea of glass and they're holding harps of God. And they sang. They sang the song of Moses, the bondservant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvellous are your works, O Lord God, the Almighty. Righteous and true are your ways, King of the nations. Who will not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy, and for all the nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. And after these things I looked, and the temple of the tabernacle of testimony in heaven was opened, and the seven angels who had the seven plagues came out of the temple, clothed in linen, clean and bright, and girded around their chests with a golden sash. And then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls, full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. And then the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no one was able to enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. So just some light reading this afternoon. Um, but important reading, exciting, exciting to understand what is yet to come. So, um, verse 1. Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvellous, seven angels who had seven plagues, which are the last, because in them the wrath of God is finished. So what's all this mean? Well, we've already established that this will take place, this particular section, towards the end of the tribulation period. It is a prelude, this chapter 15 is a prelude to the bold judgments. It's, it's given as a picture of what's going on, who's going to administer the judgments and so forth. And you notice that we have a lot of sevens. And of course, sevens in the Bible um, is, that, is that completeness. Um, and if you bring up the next slide... Oh, it's there, good. So you have that visual picture of the sevens. It's called a heptatic structure um, in sevens. We've already dealt with the, the seven sealed scroll that was opened. We've already dealt with the seven trumpet blasts and we have various parentheses in there. And now we're into, or about to start, the bold judgment. So this is the prelude to the bold judgments. And John says that he saw another sign. So we're introduced to a new vision, another, which in, in Greek, alos, means another of the same kind. And we have the setting, which is, of course, in heaven. And John's already identified or described two previous signs in heaven that he saw. He saw earlier in chapter 12 a woman clothed with the sun. Do you remember who that was? Israel. Thank you. Good. Israel. We are learning. So, and then, this, was an, this is an easy one, he also saw another sign, a great fiery dragon. Who was that? Satan the devil, yes. And so there's, here's a third sign, and it's a sign or an omen of imminent destruction. And he says, uh, John here, that great and marvellous, he says, um, are, are the things of God. You have a sense of wonder in all of this, a sense of awe. Um, it's not just a mission, it's not just given to the angels as a mission, but also it brings with it the completion of everything. And isn't that what we long for? The completion of everything? The f finality? Because the end is the beginning for us. You know, a lot of Christians maybe think, well, no, we might be here in another 2,000 years. Well, maybe we might be. But really, if you look at the world situation, you look at the things unravelling as they are, then we have to wonder. So we have these seven angels. 
seven agents of God, seven representatives, and they're called to fulfill or to complete the seven plagues. And seven plagues are, are a widespread contagious disease, I guess, that will be associated with this divine retribution. And note in verse 1, it says, these seven plagues, which are the last, okay? Eschatos, where you get the word eschatology, the last, the final, the, the farthest perimeter. So these will be the last. And then it says, because in them, the wrath, the um, thumos, the, the wrath of God, the indignation of God, the anger of God, it says it's finished. It will come to an end. It will, it will be completed at this moment in time. If you can remember, or you can look back in your own time, there were, there were six seals that were broken open. There were six trumpets. And these were described as plagues. Plagues to do what? Plagues to awaken people. Awaken people, to shake people, to bring those who are unrepentant out of their apathy and to awaken the dead soul. That's what these previous trumpets, previous breaking of the seals, sevens actually, not sixes, um, that, that's what they were designed to do, to warn of the wrath to come. But here in chapter 15, the wrath is about to be poured out, the bowls, the judgments. And so we have those who are in unbelief uh, facing this, in this period. But of course, unbelief is all around us. It's not just in the future, it's everywhere, unbelief. And of course there are consequences here in this period of time for the unbeliever, but there are already consequences in the here and now for, for every unbeliever. So there are temporal consequences, there are consequences of actions, but there are also eternal consequences. And um, when you think of the wrath of God being poured out, this being the final, if we look back in history, it's not the first time, is it? that God's had to make a clean sweep. It's not the first time where God's had to say, enough's enough. If you think of the great deluge, the pre-flood world, the antediluvian world, what that world might have even been like. Personally, I think it was an advanced civilization, And it reached a point of no return. In Genesis 6, verse 5 and 7, through to 7, it says, uh, it says there in Genesis, Yahweh saw the wickedness of man, that it was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. In other words, they reached a point where man was beyond redemption, that there had to be a clean sweep. There was, there was this slow building of what we call the cup of iniquity. The scripture says that Yahweh was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. And Yahweh said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land. From man to animals to creeping things to birds of the sky, I'm sorry that I've made them. And I don't know when you read the account, you think, well, they'll start again and they'll get it right the second time. But of course, sin was there. Sin has to be dealt with. The flood dealt with wickedness. It did not deal with sin. Sin continued and it plagues us even today. Uh, the, Peter recognised this as a historical event in 2 Peter 2.5. He said, God did not spare the ancient world, but he preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness, with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. And we had creation ministries here, didn't we? Just, was it two weeks ago? And um, they talked about the reality of Noah's flood and the evidence for it. So there has been moments in the past where God has poured out his wrath. The Apostle Paul, right at the beginning of the book of Romans, 
He spoke about the wrath of God. In verse 18 of Romans 1, he said, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in, righteousness, in unrighteousness. There's a suppression of truth. There's a suppression of what is right and what is wrong to the point now where nobody knows what is right and what is wrong. Everything is upside down. Boys don't know if they're boys and girls don't know if they're girls. And it's, it's an affront to God. It's an affront to the image of God. There's so much going on. Be careful not to be sucked into it. Because God is going to make a clean sweep as he did in the past. Uh, the Apostle Matthew records when John the Baptist was baptising and the Pharisees came out to him and the Sadducees came out to him. Do you remember what he said to them? You brood of vipers, he said. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? See, they had an understanding that God was going to purge humanity. In fact, the Jewish people believed in an age to come, a messianic age, which we believe is the age of the millennial kingdom but he asked them he warned them and he said something else he told those Sadducees and Pharisees that they should bear fruit in keeping with repentance so it was more than just fleeing from the wrath to come there would or should be uh, fruit of repentance and we'll look at that in a bit so here in Revelation 15, we're looking at the wrath of God being poured out in the Great Tribulation, followed by the day of the Lord, the return of Christ in glory. But as I've said, even though that's future, there is even now the wrath of God which hangs over the head of the unrepentant. Spurgeon wrote this on uh, the theme of of wrath. He said, The wrath to come is absolutely just. A lot of people say, Well, that's not fair. But it's not. It is. It is completely just. Absolutely just and absolutely necessary. If there be a God, He cannot let sin go <clears throat> unpunished. If He be really God and the judge of all the earth, He must have an utter abhorrence of all evil. In other words, it cannot and will not be permitted indefinitely. And of course, nations bring the wrath of God on themselves as they behave ungodly. Look at Israel. You think, how many times, how many chances, and, and they can continue to rebel. And we have a nation here today, Great Britain, that's not so great anymore, that's lost its way, That that is... Sadly, I think, has the judgment of God upon it. Particularly in relation to its dealings with Israel. So the plagues of Egypt. That was another time when God <coughs> poured out wrath on a specific group. And those plagues in Egypt are sort of prototypes, if you like, for what we see playing out in the book of Revelation at the end of time. And what did those plagues achieve back in Egypt? Well, first of all, it established that Yahweh was the one true and only God. Because everything he did um, was really to, to prove through the different plagues that their gods were no gods. But also, the plagues came in preparation for what was next. It, it, it released them from bondage, as Pharaoh let them go, and it prepared them for entry into the Promised Land. And the typology is this, that the Great Tribulation is prepa preparing the way for the age to come. It is a necessary sweep of the world. It will prove to all the earth dwellers then that God is God, that there is only one true God, the God of Israel. 
And of course, <clears throat> these judgments will be in preparation for the return of Christ and the establishment of his millennial kingdom. All right, so I've said a lot there, really, for, for verse 1, but let's press on. Verse 2, John says, I saw something like a sea of glass <clears throat> mixed with fire, and those who had been victorious over the beast and his image and the number of the name, his name, standing on the sea of glass, holding harps of God. So we, we now see a picture of the heavenly throne room so John says I saw something like when, whenever he uses that language it's, he's trying to make an analogy he's seeing something he can't really describe but he's picking something of this world to make sense of it and he says he saw a sea of glass something like a sea of glass but it was mixed <coughs> with fire now back in Revelation 4 6 we were introduced to the throne of God when John was caught up into heaven and we saw the, the splendour and the majesty of God in Revelation 4 and we saw this picture of, the, of a sea of glass but there's something different in this description it says that this sea of glass is mixed with fire so unlike in Revelation 4, 6 we have fire fire being that cleansing agent that, 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 that refining you know, the purging, the judgment. And that all comes out from, from the throne room. So not only do we have a sea of glass, the purity of God, the holiness of God, that, that separateness of God, but also the judgment of God. And it tells us here in verse 2 that he saw also those who had been victorious over the beast over his image and the number of his name so we saw a group of, of people who had been victorious the beast do you remember who we identified the beast as anyone the beast there was two beasts actually there was one from the sea and one from the earth well, the first one was the Antichrist. We identified it, him as an actual literal person who would be the Antichrist, empowered by the dragon, some say possessed by the dragon. Um, and then we have that image of the beast, or that second beast that came up, which was the false prophet, that, that, that propaganda expert who would promote the Antichrist. And then the number, of course, was 666, which people make a big fuss about, but it simply the, the, it misses the mark of perfection. We've seen all the seven, seven, sevens. Well, six is the number of men, and it misses the mark of God's perfection. It's not a mystical number. It's just and the six, six. It's just emphasis for the for missing the mark. And of course, it says that these ones are victorious over the beast, the image, and the number of his name. In other words, they've resisted. They haven't been coerced. They haven't acquiesced to what was going on during this period. I think these martyrs could well be the 144,000 because that's mentioned in the previous chapter, in uh, chapter 14. But whatever, or whoever, these are tribulation martyrs. This is not just about the martyrs of all history. This is set in this period. These are the tribulation martyrs, the overcomers. And they're standing on this sea of glass. And they're holding harps of God. This is what John sees. And it's a, a wonderful picture from being martyred and all the suffering and the struggles they went through to now being in the very presence of God. But not only that, John said that they were singing in heaven. And in verse 3, it says, And they sang the song of Moses the bondservant of God, and the song of the Lamb. Two songs they were singing, these martyrs. First of all, the song of Moses. Again, I, I think there's a connection there with the Jewishness of these, the, the connection perhaps with the 144,000. The song of Moses, well, 
In the Old Testament, there's two. In Exodus 15, Moses praises Yahweh for deliverance through the Red Sea and their victory over the enemies of God. And the second one is recorded in Deuteronomy 32, where Moses sings of the subjugation of nations. And we see this coming through in these verses, the subjugation of not just one nation, but all nations. And he warns in Deuteronomy 32 of the fiery wrath of God to come. And in fact, in Deuteronomy 32, Moses in his song lists plagues and hunger and heat and pestilence and all sorts of things that would come from God. And so we have strikingly similar language here in the Revelation, which John uses, in particular uh, chapter 14, verse 20, and in uh, chapter 19 as well. And both accounts describe what we call the Battle of Armageddon, the final culmination. But they also sing a second song, Song of Moses and also the Song of the Lamb. And so here we have the victorious martyrs celebrating what is the ultimate victory. And who wins the ultimate victory? It is the Lord Jesus Christ. He wins the victory for us over death, on the cross, over sin. And of course that, that exodus from Egypt, the Song of Moses, the victory from Egypt through the Red Sea, of course, they did Passover. They celebrated the sacrificial lamb there in Egypt. And here we have the song of the lamb, who is the, uh, the lamb of God over sin and death, and also over all the forces of evil, over all that the devil attempts to do. Jesus is the victor. He has victory. So let's read this song. Great and marvellous are your works, O Lord God the Almighty. Righteous and true are your ways, King of the nations. Lord God the Almighty. Isn't that a beautiful phrase to, to be able to sing and praise the Lord God Almighty? And it harks back to Revelation 4.8 where we have the four living creatures around the throne. And what are they doing? They're singing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. Beautiful words. And they're, they're, they're singing that in the throne room of God. It's repeated here, but this time it's the martyrs singing, O oh Lord God, the Almighty, righteous and true are your ways, the King of the nations. And there's so many psalms and so many places we could go to. If you just type into a, a search the words uh, righteous and true or King of nations, you come up with all sorts of verses that confirm what's being said. So this all-powerful, omnipotent God, in Psalm 19.9, the fear of Yahweh is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of Yahweh are true and they are righteous altogether. So we have this sense of um, continuity of who God is, his, his attributes, his character. Psalm 22, 28. For the kingdom is Yahweh's and he rules over the nations, not just Israel, but all nations. Psalm 117, 1. Yahweh, praise Yahweh, all you nations. It's a, a call for all nations to praise God, to extol him, all you peoples. And so we have this wonderful picture where the martyred saints are singing this in the, in the heavenly realm, um, which is worship, of course. The song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. But it continues this song in verse 4. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy, for all the nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. Who will not fear you, O Lord? 
who will not glorify your name. Fear, the fear of the Lord, is the beginning of understanding. And that fear <clears throat> is connected to his name. And not a name where you want to try and pin it down, like the Jehovah's Witnesses do, and you know, Jehovah's the name, or this is the name, or that's the name. It's more than a name. The object of fear is your name, but it, it involves the totality of who God is. Not just a name, not just a label, but who he is. To glorify, to praise him for all that he is. To know him personally, to know his nature, to know his character, to know his attributes. Do you know him? Do you really know him? Or do you know of him? The object of fear is to know him, to know his name. And the second reason given is because he alone, you alone, are holy. You alone are God. You alone are the truly holy one. And um, it's interesting when you look at the Greek, the Greek is uh, osios. And it's an unusual word because it's only applied to God the Father uh, twice, once here and once in Revelation 16, 5. And it, it, it encompasses holiness is that idea of being set apart, but it's more than that because here the basic meaning is sacredness. The Holy One is sacred. And so it's a call to all creation to recognize and worship His holiness, His sacredness, who He is. And of course, I've mentioned God the Father, but it embraces the whole Godhead. We worship the one true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Not bits, not, not emphasis on one more than the, the whole Godhead. Who will not fear you, O Lord? Who will not glorify your name? To glorify God. I mean... How do we do that in our lives? How do we do that in our everyday life? To glorify God, to glorify his name. That's a question for each of us. But we are to fear God and to give him glory. It's repeated earlier in chapter 14, verse 7. Fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. And of course, in this song, in verse 4, the latter part, it speaks of the nations as well. It says, all nations will come and worship before you. Has that ever happened? Where all nations have worshipped the one true God? Well, that surely has to be fulfilled. It can't be fulfilled if, if Jesus returns and, and then just... You know, that's it, wraps it up and we enter the new heavens and new earth. All nations, there's a subjugation of nations in this. And therefore Jesus will return to subdue the nations, to rule them with an iron rod. All nations will come and worship. I think it's in, um, I think it's in Zechariah at the end, or Zephaniah, where it says all nations will come and worship. So these are future things that will happen. And there's a beautiful uh, verse in chapter 19 of Revelation where it says, From his mouth, and we, we've got a slight change now because it's referring to Jesus. From his mouth comes a sharp sword so that he may what? Strike the nations. He will rule them with a rod of iron. Well, that's not heaven, is it? That's earth. It's the return of Christ to rule and to reign. He treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. That's the Father. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, which is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So we see this song in heaven will be played out on earth. And so after the purging of earth through these various plagues, the survivors of this will enter the Messianic Kingdom. I don't know if you've ever thought of this, but there'll actually be two types of 
beings on earth. There will be the saints who will be glorified, who will be immortal, that's you and me. And there will be those who survive through the tribulation who will be the earth dwellers, who will populate the earth in the millennium. Whereas we will be rulers, co-rulers. Have you thought about that? Our future is incredible. It, it is completely mind-blowing when we begin to think about it. And of course, at the end of all of this, every knee will bow to Jesus. Every tongue will conf confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Spurgeon wrote this. He said, If now for a time the full manifestation of that anger is delayed, I beseech you men and brethren, do not therefore trifle with it. The longer God's arm is uplifted, the more terrible will be the blow when he at last strikes. <laughs> so, verse 5. John says that after these things I looked, and the temple of the tabernacle of testimony in heaven was opened. After these things. This is a transition to a new vision. Um, Chimeta Tauta, it's afterwards, I looked, I saw something different. He saw a temple in heaven. Now some try and spiritualise the temple to mean the church. Others try and make it earthly and say it's the, the temple of the Antichrist uh, during the tribulation. But the vision is in heaven. So we have to allow that to dictate. And then we have the mention of the tabernacle. Why the tabernacle? Surely that's Old Testament stuff. But what we have is a combination of language drawing from uh, the Old Testament, from Numbers 10 and Exodus 15. And this temple of the tabernacle of testimony is really the innermost throne of God where the typology of what was past, i.e. the tabernacle and the temple, is fulfilled in Christ. That's what I think. I think it is simply a picture of heaven and of our Lord. In fact, in Hebrews 8, verse 1 and 2, that's where they he tried to um, drive home to them the typology that we see in heaven. We have such a high priest, Jesus, who has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of majesty in the heavens, a minister in the sanctuary and in the true tabernacle, you see, the true tabernacle, which the Lord uh, pitched not men so this abode this temple of the tabernacle of the testimony that is what john is seeing and of course it will slowly give way to other changes i mean have you ever thought about where it says in revelation about the the new jerusalem that comes out of heaven and somehow docks with earth in, in the new heavens and new earth you think well how's that work how's this it's just, the whole thing is just, just mind-blowing. And I don't think we can just spiritualise it away and it's here for us to study, to learn and to be built by. Alright, so then what happens? Well, it says in verse 6, The seven angels who had the seven plagues came out of the temple, clothed in linen, clean and bright, and girded around their chests with golden sashes. So we have a description, first of all, of these angels. They are clothed in linen. They are clean and bright. Of course, a symbol of purity. And it befits their mission. Their mission, although tragic for the earth, it is a, still a mission to purify. It's a mission to prepare for the return of Christ. That's their mission. Hence they're clothed. And they also have this golden sash around their chest, which is unusual. In fact, Jesus is described back in Revelation 1.13 as having a golden sash. 
Nobody's quite sure if there's anything in that. Some say it's the, the symbol of their mission. You know, this is, this is their mission. The sashes worn uh, by the, the priests in the Old Testament were golden. But of course in the Old Testament it was to bring blessing. But in this case it's to bring, bring judgment. But judgment for the glory of God. In verse 7 it says, Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. So we now go back to that picture of those four creatures around the, the throne and one of the four living creatures gives to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God. I don't know if we've yeah, we've got that. That's just an artist's impression of what one of them might be. Um, but definitely one of these four living creatures give the bowls. Ezekiel 1 verse 5 mentions similar living creatures that he sees. And of course these ones occupy a place around the throne. So they're playing a role as well within these judgments. In fact in chapter 6 with this, the breaking of the judgment seals, the, the, it was um, living creatures that, that said, well, you maybe can remember, John said, I heard the living creatures say, come, and then this happened, and then the next one, come, and then this happened. In Revelation 5, 8, we find the four living creatures before the Lamb, each one holding a harp, golden bowls full of incense which are the prayers of the saints so those bowls were different they were the incense uh, of the saints but here these are different bowls these bowls are full of what? the wrath of God overflowing it says with the wrath of God so we are to flee from the wrath of God brethren the wrath of God, it's um, in, in the Greek, uh, thumos, it's, it's like heavy breathing. You know, where you're just getting more and more angry and you get <sighs> until you just explode. It's that sense within the, the Greek, this passion, this fierceness, this indignation, this state of intense anger that just comes out in the end. But it's a righteous anger. It's a pure anger. It's a godly anger. And it's an anger against what? It's against sin. It's an anger against sin. Not the earth that God's created, but sin in it. Spurgeon wrote this. He said to sin against the patience and long-suffering of Almighty God is to sin with a vengeance. You do, as it were, defiantly put your finger into the very eye of God when you know that he sees your sin and yet you go on sinning because he does not immediately take vengeance upon you for all your evil works. And that's true, isn't it? We see that. The world around us, oh, well, God, I don't believe in God, I'll live my life how I want, there's no consequence. And yet every time they're poking their finger in the eye of God. And Spurgeon says, It is in great love that he, that our Lord, restrains his wrath, for he is slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. But as a torrent that is dammed up for a while and gathers force and strength, and every hour in which it is kept back, it gets to be more irresistible, so must it be with the wrath to come. It's just building up. It's just building. In the end, it gives way. At last it comes. Spurgeon said, If it has been waited upon for some of you for 70 years or 60 years or 50 years or 20 years, it will come as an overwhelming flood when at length it bursts the barriers which, it, which at present hold it. And he warns, Trifle not, therefore, with that long-suffering God. 
God is angry against sin. This, what we've read, is the finality of it all, of the coming of the wrath of God. And it will be like nothing the world has ever seen before. It will be a divine judgment like nothing before. We think of the flood and there's a, the, a complete cleansing of the world, but this is, this is like nothing before. Jesus Christ himself said this in Matthew 24, 21. There will be a great tribulation, said Jesus. Such has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will again. And if those days had not been cut short, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. This is the days of the great tribulation. And of course, it is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. In verse 8, as we close this, John records that what he saw, the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no one was able to enter the temple until the seven plagues and the seven angels were finished. Smoke, he sees. Smoke symbolising the presence of God to emphasise that the judgments of God originate with him. And of course, we could go back into the Old Testament and we could look when ever smoke is mentioned. I thought of Mount Sinai in Exodus 19. In verse 18 it says, Mount Sinai was all in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. And its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace and the entire mountain quaked violently. The presence of God, we call it the Shekinah glory. And of course the Shekinah glory filled the tabernacle. The Israelites saw the Shekinah glory. The Shekinah glory filled the temple when it was built by Solomon. And we've just been studying in the book of Acts how God's glory came at Pentecost. The presence of God as the tongues like fire were distributed. And so he sees this. He sees the smoke that filled the temple from the glory of God. It's a visible manifestation of his power. And it says that no one was able to enter the temple. Just like in the days of Solomon, where the Shekinah glory filled the temple and it, it was just, well, it's beyond anything we can think of, the presence of God himself. So no one could em enter the temple. But the fact is that, that no created being can gaze on the glory of God. Because according to the scripture, God dwells in unapproachable light. I believe that refers to God the Father. Because of course Jesus is a very representation of the Father. He's the one who we can see. He's the one who the disciples described as being able to touch and see. We've, we've touched life itself in Christ. But men cannot gaze on the, the fullness of God. I mean, can anyone travel to the sun and land on it? Of course not. You just burn up before you got there. And, and God breathed that sun out. He spoke it into existence. And the rest of the universe. So how dare we think we can... I mean, I, I've met people who say, oh, when, when I get up there, I'm going to give them a good pace. And I'm thinking, what are you talking about? Ridiculous. And so no one can approach or gaze upon the glory of God. And Moses, he requested to see the glory of God. And do you remember God's reply? He said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you. I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence, but you cannot see my face. For no one can see my face and live. And you'll find in the Bible it never describes never gives you a description of God 
is face. It will give anthropomorphisms of, of the body so that we can understand, but nothing of features because we're told we should not make images of God. We cannot. How can you? God is a spirit. So Moses saw a glimpse of the divine reality and what happened to his face? Do you remember he came down off the mountain and his own face shone having seen something of the divine being. And the apostles, they saw something of the glory of God in the transfiguration when Jesus was transfigured. And it's interesting that who did he speak to at the transfiguration? Jesus was speaking to Moses. <laughs> and so the glory of God. No one was able to enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. And so we come to the end of chapter 15. But as we conclude, just some thoughts. Spurgeon, when I looked at um, how he uh, taught on the wrath of God, he recognised the impending danger to every soul now. It's not just the future. He said, I feel quite staggered as I try to speak of this wrath to come. Because when it does come, it must be something very terrible because divinity enters into the essence of it. It's not from men. It's not from ancient aliens. It's from God, the creator of all things. Spurgeon asks, what will the wrath to come be? If God but touches a man, as it were, with only his little finger, the strongest must at once fail and fall. The mightiest can scarcely open his eyes, and the seal of death is speedily imprinted on his brow. But what will it be when the hand of God shall begin to plague the ungodly, when he shall pour out all the vials of his wrath upon them and crush them with the bosses of his buckler? And you can, in it, as you read, you see Spurgeon trying to make, what will it be like? What will this be like for humanity? So undeniably, there is coming a future that God has preordained where he will put a finish to sin. He's put a finish to sin through the work of the cross and the Lord Jesus, but he must purge now. It will come. And how might a person escape from this wrath to come? How might a person escape from the wrath that is already upon them? As Paul explained, that the wrath of God, it was on us, wasn't it? The wrath of God. How do we escape that? Spurgeon identified it. He said, there is no way of deliverance from the wrath to come. Only by flight, he said, we must flee from the wrath to come. To flee from the wrath to come. Recall Sodom and Gomorrah where they pleaded with Lot and his family to flee, to come out in Genesis uh, nineteen seventeen, When they brought them outside one said, escape for your life do not look behind do not stay anywhere in the surrounding area, escape to the mountains or you will be swept away. Don't look back. Don't look back. Virgin stated, we, we cannot bear it. We cannot bear the wrath of God. We must flee from it. How do we flee from it? Where do we flee to? Well, first of all, to flee is not to amble along, is it? To flee is not to crawl on the floor. To flee is an immediate action. And it is a swift action. It's to do something about it. Spurgeon said, he that flees for his life does not creep and crawl, he runs at his utmost speed. He wishes he could ride on the wings of the wind and no space that he can reach is fast enough for him, no pace. Oh, if God the Holy Spirit will make you, whom I am now addressing, feel your imminent danger, you will want to fly to Christ with the swiftness of the lightning flash. You will be satisfied to linger as you have, as you are even, uh, will not linger for another hour. In other words, we are to flee 
to Christ. He is the ark. He is our salvation. He is the one who, who, who... He is our escape from the wrath to come. He is our escape from the wrath that is already here. When Paul wrote to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 1 through to 2, he urged them, he said, Working together with him, we urge you not to receive the grace of God in vain. There's a challenge. Not to receive the grace of God in vain. Not to escape the wrath to come and then just sit down. He says, At a favourable time I listened to you, on a day of salvation I helped you, and behold, now is the favourable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Spurgeon said, There is no going to heaven by following the road to hell. There is no finding pardon while sin continues. There must be repentance and that repentance must be practical. And what he means by that, it must have evidence of change. It must bring forth fruits of repentance. Evidence of a changed life. Evidence of a changed character, changed thinking, changed attitudes, changed goals, changed perspectives. And so, I hope you all here today and listening have ran, have ran to the Saviour, that you, you, you've, you've thrown yourself at the foot of the cross, that you, you're hanging on to that, you're following the Master, you're hanging on to his skirt tails, because we're saved, how? Not by hiding under the mountains, not, not by prepping and all these, we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Isn't that wonderful? That we flee from the wrath to come in such a simple way. Simple submission to the Most Holy One, to the Almighty God. But of course, first of all, we must hear the Gospel. We must hear the good news about Jesus' death and resurrection. We must understand, to some degree, our own sinfulness before a holy God. And then we must believe, which is to trust to have faith is to simply trust, to trust and fully trust in the Lord. And of course, that involves repentance. It re involves acknowledgement. It involves changing of the mind and then calling upon the name. Have you called upon the name? Do you know him? If you have ran to Jesus, if you have been born again, of his spirit then I believe you are guaranteed of the escape from the wrath of God I don't believe in this you can lose your salvation I believe in eternal security because he holds you okay but what he does do he urges you and I to keep walking he heeds us to produce fruits of repentance and maybe you're struggling maybe we all struggle. Life is not easy. We're, we're up and down and round. It's, life is tough. Things hit us from nowhere. Sometimes it can be illness. Sometimes it can be depression. All sorts of things can overwhelm us. But remember that he is here to deliver us. If you have ran to him, then he will help you. Whatever you're struggling with, whatever it is, then he's asking you, he's asking me to cry out. Because we can go to every other place looking for answers, but all we have to do is look up and cry. And to cry out, Lord, God, help me. And sometimes he brings you to the end of yourself in order to do that. Cry out to him. Lord, help me. Give me that burning desire in my soul to serve you, the one true almighty God. Give me that. Give me that what I, what I see, what I desire to serve. To share in, and remember this, 
to share in the greatest work that's ever been known which is to share the good news to be part of the harvest work to warn sinners of the wrath to come to point people to the way of escape who is Jesus Christ our Lord and Saviour God bless let's pray merciful Heavenly Father Lord we do thank you for your word Lord there's many deep things and sometimes difficult to understand things but when we peel it all back Lord it's about you it's about you and your love for us and we recognize Lord that we once lived under the wrath of God we once lived in sin and trespasses but now Lord you've set us free and I pray Lord that those who may listen to this or watch this online or that Lord those who don't know you you set them free Lord we live in such a messed up world there's so many so much evil and, and ungodliness help us not to wink at such things help us not to just paint over it help us to get a sense of how you feel and help us to warn the unsaved because Lord your message is one of love and grace and acceptance and a call to come and know you and fellowship with you but in that there's also a warning that those who would reject your love those who would not respond will pay an eternal consequence and Lord that is not your wish and we just pray that we can be fishers of men that we can be used by you and that you would awaken in us a desire and a passion Lord to serve you and to serve within the local church to serve Lord in whatever capacity and uh, at work and wherever we're placed wherever you place us Lord for us not to forget that we're ambassadors of Christ and so we bless you and we thank you for this word of scripture and we thank you uh, for the truth of your word and we bless you the almighty God the one true living God in Jesus name Amen Thank you so much for watching to the end. If you like this video, please click the subscribe button to help this channel reach more people with the truth of the gospel. Thank you for your support and encouragement. God bless.